Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's talk. Uh, it is truly my pleasure and I'm very delighted to be able to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Jean Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen received her master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Calgary, her PhD in biomedical engineering from McGill University, and then she did a postdoctoral um, fellowship using multimodal MRI uh, methods to study brain imaging at the Martino Center um, at Harvard's MGH. And then she joined the University of Toronto as a faculty member in 2011 in medical biophysics and at the Rotman Research Institute, where she's currently a senior scientist and holds a tier two Canada research chair in neuroimaging of aging. And so what does all that mean? That means we know her work very well. Um, Dr. Chen's probably most well known, at least in my opinion, um, for working out imaging sequences that we use just in all of our own work every day, but most importantly, working out the troubles and the assumptions that we make in those um, types of imaging modalities. For example, she was one of the first to identify and try to solve the vascular bias noise um, in resting state bold imaging and just in general to uh, help try to discern the vascular from the neural contributions to different imaging signals. Um, she's recently turned her attention back toward diffusion weighted imaging and so today she's going to discuss the particular benefits of kurtosis imaging for the study of aging which i'm very very much looking forward to so please join me in a very warm welcome to dr jean chen thank you so much for that kind intro and it's truly my pleasure to be here today sorry not to be able to uh, attend in person it would have been a pleasure to revisit dallas so um I will, yes, today, um, so <laughs> despite so the, all the work that we've done using resting state fMRI in aging, we are going to talk about diffusion imaging. Um, so maybe a, a, a few words about where I'm coming from. So my lab is actually at the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest, and uh, some of you maybe may may know about Baycrest. Is, it was when I joined, um, ranked number one worldwide in cognitive neuroscience of aging. Um, and it, it uh, currently has 25 uh, faculty members and uh, more than 100 trainees, um, so that's including my own lab. And we're also part of the University of Toronto. And our, our hospital was recently ranked number one research intensive hospital in Canada. And we have sort of uh, a full suite of imaging um, tools, and this is just a glimpse of the, uh, the entrance. Um, if you ever should visit, um, I know one of your colleagues is actually giving a virtual talk at Baycrest today. And this is an in, sort of a quick overview of my own lab's research. Um, so today I'll be focusing on this middle column. Uh, so the DTI theme is one of the, sort of the sub teams in my lab, uh, looking mostly at free water imaging of aging, fixed based analysis of aging, and also how to get more from modeling the single shell isotropic diffusion tensor in aging. Um, but of course, as, um, as Kristen just said, we also uh, focus heavily on fMRI, specifically resting state fMRI, trying to discern the vascular contributions. This has been our focus for, for quite some time. Um, recently, also uh, kind of translating to the clinical theme where we apply various discoveries to studying uh, diseases that are related to, to brain um, degeneration. So um, I know today's talk is focused on so kurtosis as the novelty and what it offers um, beyond DTI. But first, I thought it would be good to actually give a quick overview of what DTI is able to offer in the first place. So white matter aging, you guys are experts on this. Um, so it can be divided into macro scale and micro scale. So at the macro uh, macroscopic scale, white matter atrophy has been well reported associated with increased uh, cerebrospinal fluid fraction. So this is for both sexes. Generally, the, the, the white matter shrinks with aging. 
But at the microscopic scale, where most of our work has been focused, is um, we, we see this sort of in the, um, the mouse model, an increase in extracellular space with age. You can see the axons getting bigger, and there's just more space in between them. So these are both things that are happening, and at different stages of, of aging slash neurodegeneration, we see different sort of uh, um, contributions of these. And this is where um, DTI comes in. It has truly been the workhorse of white matter aging studies, uh, really revolutionized what we can see um, in the in vivo brain. It's used to mostly measure water diffusivity using Gaussian modeling. So assuming water diffusion is Gaussian and measures fiber tract integrity through diffusivity, MD, um, and or fractional anisotropy FA. So these are sort of the bread and butter for most uh, DTI aging researchers. And in general, MD increases and FA decreases in aging are what we expect to see as a sign of microstructural degeneration. So this is all sort of a foundational knowledge to date. So sorry to have to show at least you know, a, a few equations, but this sort of summarizes what conventional DTI is all about. You, you measure the signal on the left from the scanner, and then you try to estimate uh, so what these other parameters are, primarily this diffusion tensor D. So this is the key. This is what we are you know, working hard towards, getting a better measurement of this D. Um, so typically, conventional DTI consists of a single shell. In this equation sense, it means that the B value, there's just one single non-zero B value. So that's a single shell acquisition as we refer to it in general. And so this diffusion tensor is really just an ellipsoid. It's like an elongated football. You have these three uh, axes of this football represented by these three eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, so we have one shell. We fit this one model. And that gives us these two very well-known um, parameters. Many people use them, but not everyone is aware of how they're calculated. So the mean diffusivity is calculated by averaging the three eigenvalues, whereas the uh, fractional anisotropy is really a ratio between the second moment of the eigenvalues and MD, so some measure of MD. We have actually done tremendously with these two very simple parameters, but we can further decompose MD into axial diffusivity, which is based on the primary diffusion direction, as well as radial diffusivity, which is the mean of the other, the remaining two directions. You can appreciate everything really rests on the estimation of this tensor. And the primary direction, while it can be, you know, much longer than the other two, sometimes it isn't. It's just a teeny bit larger than the other. So, so the interpretation requires some um, caution. But overall, we've had a good run with the robust findings. Um, what about sort of the extravascular space that I was showing earlier? So if we do expect an aging to exhibit increased extravascular space, which means that the actual um, volume of the white matter bundle as a whole may or may not change, but the distance between individual axons is bigger. So this is what that means, increased extracellular space. Are we able to see that using conventional DTI? Actually, for the most part, yes. So that's mostly reflected in increased MD and decreased F8, which we always, almost always see with aging. So while it doesn't tell us just how much space there or change in extracellular space there is, it does tell us that that is sort of the primary explanation for what um, might be happening here uh, as illustrated by this cartoon, going from young to old. Now, um, this will remind you that, so fibers in the brain are mostly crossing, so very rarely do we see a whole bundle just like this, completely uh, unidirectional. So if we bring the fiber crossing into the picture, then the story becomes, you know, there, there are a lot more facets to it. So this is a, a, a quite a complex graphic. I'll walk you through a step at a time. 
Um, so let's look at so the story of a fiber crossing, extra uh, extracellular and cellular diffusion. So these are the sort of ways in which we kind of categorize um, our observations. Um, so on the left here, in the background here, you see this kind of strong long fiber. This is seen as being intact, you know, with full myelin sheets, very little distance between fibers, and it is uh, intact. And this is also being seen as a primary fiber direction. So when two fibers cross, the two fiber populations are not typically equal. So one of them might be the dominant one, giving rise to your um, axial diffusivity, whereas the others might be secondary. And when we talk about secondary, I illustrate two different cases, one in which the secondary fiber is quite intact, and then the other one in which it is not so intact, has extended extracellular space. So far, so increased interaxonal or extracellular space um, may not translate into changing white matter volume, as I mentioned before. So at this stage, the atrophy aspect may not yet be apparent. However, it is degenerating. Whereas if over time, this fluid in between the cellular, um, the cellular bodies or the, the axons actually drain out, then they start to compact. And then you see sort of this um, increased uh, CSF or increased interstitial fluid and you, you see these fibers being compacted and then you can say this is atrophy. This is going from this to this is sort of how we picture atrophy being detectable. So this brings us to point B where collapsed interaxonal space uh, results in reduced white matter volume and increased CSF volume. So this is what we can see from still sort of somewhat a mesoscopic scale. But if we zoom in to the extracellular space, which is C, then you can say, um, so why is this extracellular space in blue increasing? Why must it be increasing in aging? So a primary culprit would be demyelination, which leads to falling apart of the myelin sheaths, increasing extracellular isotropic diffusion. There's just more space for water molecules to diffuse. This, this is one component of this sort of a tensor. And the other component is the cellular space. So, so that's if you zoom in further, digging into each of these axons, you see that it's encased um, with myelin sheaths and an increased radio diffusivity and decreased axial diffusivity uh, would indicate that more water is leaking out radially through the degenerating myelin sheaths, which is the hallmark of uh, degeneration, so demyelination. So all of this we have to represent with a single tensor, which of course you can appreciate it is tricky, but we have nonetheless uh, a history of well reproducible DTI findings in aging. So I will come back to this cartoon in a moment, but let's just review what we usually see in the DTI study of aging. So AD is axial diffusivity, RD is radial diffusivity, MD is mean diffusivity, and of course FA. So pretty much the segregation along the borders between diffusivity and FA. So FA uniformly goes down with age, whereas um, diffusivity uniformly goes up uh, with the exception of a few little voxels. So this is in a cohort of 212 healthy aging subjects, and this is what we saw. And this is also you know, well documented. So relating this back to that cartoon, also, there's this theory of is this last in first out uh, that we're the pattern that we're seeing. Um, so relating this back to our cartoon, this is the same cartoon I showed now tagging on these findings. So with this uh, degeneration here, increased axonal space, unchanged white matter volume, we do sort of see in um, correspondingly lower FA and higher MD. So lower FA and higher MD also, if we have collapsed interaxonal space resulting in observable atrophy, we still expect to see lower FA. Um, so looking ex uh, exclusively at the extracellular space, there's increased extracellular space here, 
and and that's usually manifested in a higher MD. And lastly, cellular space. Uh, if we see this demyelination, impairment of axial diffusivity and accelerated radial diffusivity, then we see increased uh, RD, decreased AD, or sometimes no change in AD, and reduced FA. So all of these phenomena have a corresponding observation in the very simple conventional DTI space. So using a single tensor, so far so good. However, sometimes we and others have seen that FA can actually increase or the, it seems to higher in the older adults compared to the young, as you see here. This was not shown in our group of 212 subjects. That result did not have this. But this one with 700 subjects, it does. And we're not the only one seeing this, and maybe you have seen this. So what is going on? Where does this fall in with our cartoon? This is the, the first question. Actually, this opens up interesting possibilities for conventional DTI. Um, so you can see here, MD is increasing as we expected to with age, whereas FA is mostly decreasing, but except in this area. So, so what is going on? Now, I mentioned before, we do some work in uh, free water imaging. So the point of free water imaging is really to kind of separate extracellular space from cellular space. So if we take away the effect of all this water in between, uh, theoretically, we are left with something that's much more specific to the axon itself. So if we did that, then we kind of see this. Even in a small sample, we went from before, this is what I showed you a moment earlier, zooming in on one image, FA versus H. Ah. And if we do three water imaging, lo and behold, there is this area symmetrical, very clearly demonstrating increased FA with age. So, so what is going on then? This, why is this more apparent once we get rid of the free water? Um, this is what we think is happening, is that we have, you know, the primary fiber direction, which I showed earlier. If we had a healthy secondary fiber, this is what it will look like in the young population. But presumably in the older population, there is a selective degeneration of the secondary fiber, leading to the overall tensor being more elongated, giving rise to a higher FA than in the younger population. So this, in other words, in our opinion, is a, is a situation that's unique to uh, crossing fibers. It is essential to understand how the neurodegenerative process actually competes with the crossing uh, effect when we're, we're having to rely on a single tensor for all of our measurements. But fortunately, there is a way to get this out of the FA. But the question is, can we do this without having a much uh, larger sample, maybe on the thousands or at least some hundred? Or can we do this without free water imaging? Can we do this all? Can we actually observe this increased FA with conventional DTI? So this is sort of the work of my student, Jordan Chad, um, who's defending his thesis soon. And he actually came up with the acronym for our lab. Um, so his paper from 2021 20, actually uh, addresses this very question. So what can DTI still offer us? So um, these you've seen before, just to kind of simplify it. So these two equations you saw before as being derived from this diffusion tensor. But the question is FA. FA actually is not independent of MD. It has this MD term in the in the denominator, as you can see. So if you're using FNMD to represent your age-related findings, you're actually not reporting two different perspectives. You're reporting one perspective that's slightly you know, reflected through different ways from these two parameters. So, so that's the first realization, is that FNMD are not unrelated, and they, they're not each providing unique information. Maybe MD is, but FA is you know, dependent on MD. So what should we do about this? 
is there anything we should do and what was the benefit of doing that? I will show in a bit. So um, if we were to look at MD increases, it may actually compete with anisotropy increases at fiber crossings. And this might actually be the reason why if we have um, only FA from conventional DTI, most of the time we do not see an increase in FA with aging. That's the truth. Most of the time we don't see it. So this might be the cause. Is this the cause? So Jordan went ahead and proposed a different a way to look at anisotropy. So instead of FA, which is conflated with MD, he proposed to just look at the, the numerator of the FA expression. So all this is, is the second moment of the eigenvalues, which we call the norm of anisotropy. So all this is, is taking the, the numerator of the F FA, which seems to be the most obvious thing to do. And on top of that, there is also the mode of anisotropy, uh, which fewer people use. But nonetheless, these three uh, parameters now, MD, FA, and NO, combine to form the first, second, and third moments of the tensor eigenvalues. So, so that is a kind of a nice conceptual ring to it. And they are, in addition, orthogonal to each other. So now we can finally say, these three parameters are not related. They, they are each providing something unique. Um, they, they may coincide in their interpretations, but at least they are all orthogonal slash independent of each other. This is actually not the first time this was proposed, except this was the first time it was applied to the study of aging. So back in 2006, uh, Ennis and Kindleman actually had this paper in which they illustrated the mode of anisotropy. So mode actually increases uh, when the tensor becomes more linear. So you can observe on the extreme right, when the mode is at its highest, you have a single fiber scenario, whereas if you are at the lower mode, then you have a planar slash crossing dispersion scenario. So this is how to interpret mode. So when we have a crossing fiber, we expect there to be a lower mode value, correspondingly a lower FA. So, so this is where the tensor is not really very elongated. To now further illustrate sort of what we can get, so what more can we get from conventional DTI using only these three things? So on the right is an example of a young tensor. So it's intact, um, so reasonable MD. NA is very high, which means it's a single, very intact, uh, elongated tensor, whereas MO is also reasonably high. So as I, we said before, a high MO means an elongated tensor. Now, if we added isotropic diffusion to this healthy young tensor, which means we're letting it degenerate, creating more extracellular space, then we see this older tensor in which MD uh, becomes higher compared to the 0 0.8, and it is, in, it is now 1, but NA and MO are unchanged. So in other words, we can discern the entire change from the MD change itself, which tells us, okay, so the, the underlying fiber hasn't changed, it's just that there's now more extracellular fluid. Whereas, if we were to have this sort of a scenario where the tensor actually becomes uh, deeper. If you, if you compare the top and the bottom, you see the tensor becoming deeper. And then you see the sort of the main change um, of that tensor becoming deeper is reflected in both NA and MO in different ways. So both of them go down, but they also represent very different things about the tensor, right? So one of them simply talks about how elongated it is without mentioning if it's planar or if it's deeper or, you know, a combination thereof, whereas F MO becomes reduced. This is indicating that the now the fiber, this tensor or fiber is more fanned out. So the difference between this right top and the right bottom cartoon is that the FA is now very different. So this is, you know, the FA value corresponding to these cases for reference, uh -huh. but the shape matrix uh, as um, reflected by the orthogonal tensor decomposition 
uh, it's much more descriptive of what's actually happening. So, so this is what sort of the take home for this little part of this talk is that so we have now a new set of DTI parameters that you can get from nothing more than conventional DTI. So with a single shell acquisition, run your DTI fit through FSL, and then with an additional one step, you can get a new set of three parameters that can potentially tell you much more about what's happening to the microstructure. So uh, coming back to the story of selective degeneration, so how does this help us visualize it? So we set out to find out using 700 healthy UK biobank subjects. Uh, again, they have sort of two shell acquisitions, but we took one of the shells to emulate a conventional DTI uh, setup. And these are the findings. I'll pause a moment to let you have a look. So on the top row is MD versus H, the middle row is NA versus H, and the bottom row is MO versus H. So one of our key aims was to kind of try to see the selective degeneration in sort of the internal capsule um, crossing with the uh, cerebrospinal tract. So do we see that? If we do, we expect there to be an increased NA with H, and there's a big chunk of it right here. So this is what we were wanting to see before with FA, and now we do see it with NA. At the same time, to kind of complement that, we see in this very same region, MO is also increasing. Remember, increased MO represents a more linear uh, elongated fiber uh, shape. So, so in this region, the fiber has come from being more crossed, more fanning, spread out to more linear. So this is what this is saying. So what could give rise to that, except that the crossing is becoming less crossed. So this is consistent with the selective degeneration story. Another interesting finding is this posterior inferior white matter here seems to show no effect when we're looking at MD versus H. So this is sort of a messed out spot is blank. Whereas if you look at MO, also seems to show no effect. But when we look at NA, so the anisotropic uh, measure, we do see an effect. So it's less anisotropic than before without there being more diffusivity. So this is the question. What is happening here? Um, our theory is that the mean diffusivity being sort of an average of axial versus radial diffusivity, there is some sort of uh, uneven distribution. So in one of the directions, the diffusivity might be increasing, but in another direction, diffusivity might be decreasing. So this is what can lead to a less elongated shape for our tensor, which is reflected in this uh, decreased NA. But this difference also, um, I mean, the differences also may cancel each other out when we combine everything into just a single MD value. So you may see nothing here if you're only looking at MD. This is actually something that can only be observed when you decompose it. Doesn't mean there's nothing happening. So this is another very key uh, point. We'll come back to these two regions as we go along because they are so interesting. Um, so now you might ask, so you show this increased uh, an isotropy, so couldn't you have seen that same thing with FA? Did you actually see an improvement? And the, the, the answer to that is yes, indeed we did. So we looked at the effect size difference between um, using NA and using FA as a function of age. And NA came out on top strongly in this region. So NA did allow us to better observe this increased FA in aging. So that's what we wanted to know. Now to break it down further, I did talk about this possibility that in the posterior inferior white matter, there might be differential changes in different directions of the tensor with age. And you can sort of appreciate that here if we just decompose all of that into lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, all of which you get with DTR fit. So there's not much change in the primary fiber direction. If anything, it's, it's a little bit reduction in diffusivity, whereas in the tertiary fiber direction, there is an increase. 
interfusivity. So this, this, there you have it. Basically, this is showing us that um, there's impeded diffusivity in one direction, canceling out this increased diffusivity in another direction, resulting in no change in the MD in aging. So just to wrap it all up, what can DTI offer? Norm of NSR trophy is available from conventional DTI. It's very easy to compute. The age effects are stronger than that of FA, as I showed, indicating existing uh, crossing fibers. So, so this is very strong proof of that. NA is a measure of NSR trophy that is unbiased by diffusivity. This is an important reason why it is better than FA for such a question. And positive NA age effects coupled with positive MOH effects indicate that the, the voxel we're, we're observing is becoming more linear um, with less crossing effects. So this could um, indicate selective degeneration. And that lastly, our, our sort of new friend, this posterior inferior white matter region, which shows a lack of MD effect with age. And um, it has a negative NA age effect. So if you recall from two slides ago, this could be that diffusion is impaired in the primary tensor direction, but it's actually enhanced in another, in the radial direction. So, so this is, there is something going on, and this could actually be in a sort of earlier stage of degeneration, if anything. So having said that, you might be um, curious to try this out on your data. Um, but we took a step further to kind of see if we had kurtosis imaging, what does it actually offer beyond that? So we've already shown that conventional DTI can be improved with some simple steps to enhance its sensitivity. So what does DKI offer on top of that? So, uh, so this is work by my student Heba and again Jordan as a co-author. It just came out this year. So DKI or diffusion or kurtosis imaging has been in existence for quite some time, um, more than I would say 20 years now. DKI is an extension of uh, DTI that measures kurtosis um, or non-gaussianity of water diffusion. Mm -hmm. So simple, in simple terms, it's a marker of tissue complexity and diffusional heterogeneity. So a way to visualize this, so on this bottom is a very flat curve with negative kurtosis, which doesn't exist in bio biological tissue, but this is where there's least heterogeneity, whereas on top, this very sharp one with high kurtosis represent where there's more tissue complexity. And higher is usually better for biological tissue. So in my previous work at the Martino Center, we did show um, DKI can, can tell us quite a lot about white matter aging. So this is work by my colleague Jean-Philippe Coutu, looking at linear age effects broken down into these three categories. Uh, so mean kurtosis versus axial, mean kurtosis versus radio. And so they do overlap quite a bit. So the overall story is that we were able to observe not only linear age effects, but also quadratic uh, effects of age. So, so kurtosis varying as a quadratic function of age. And it turned out that kurtosis was even more sensitive uh, to age than, than diffusivity was. So that was one of the main findings. But it didn't, uh, I think it stopped short of actually trying to compare diffusivity and kurtosis and try to integrate them quantitatively. So that's what we set out to do with HIBA and Jordan. Uh, so a recap of the previous finding was that reductions in kurtosis with age reflect disruption of macrostructural organization leading to less coherent anisotropy. So this could be axonal packing density um, reduction, could be demyelination, could be axonal shrinkage. So all of these things could lead to reduced kurtosis and DKI did find more, um, provide more sensitivity than DTI even then. Now, increases in kurtosis can also be seen, not typically observed in normal aging, but can arise from tumorous growth. And we, we typically don't expect to see this, but, but who knows? Let's see what this current study actually shows us. 
So again, we, we started from first principles. We looked at the, DK, the DKI model. So DKI is nowadays pretty easy to implement. There is a toolbox in MATLAB. Um, there is a toolbox in Python. So uh, if you have data, if you're slightly um, uh, familiar with these two programming languages, it's actually much easier to actually get uh, kurtosis maps than it was all those years ago. But um, we wanted to just see what we should expect from looking at kurtosis versus uh, diffusivity. So again, this is sort of, I would say, very same uh, equation as I showed before. Really, it is everything is the same up to the point of this plus sign. So after the plus sign is where the kurtosis comes in. And you can see this is actually a term in which kurtosis and diffusivity interact. Now, if we were to solve for this for some sort of uh, hypothetical um, age effect, for, as an example, if we expect in aging, there's a certain delta D, which represents a change in diffusivity as represented by the DTI model. We can see that is actually the diffusivity as it's represented by this top equation minus a term that includes this kurtosis term. So what does that mean? That means right off the bat from looking at nothing but this equation, we expect that the sensitivity of a DTI based diffusivity measure to be lower than that of a kurtosis based diffusivity measure just by looking at this equation. So that's what we expect already. What does that also mean? There are no, so there's no universal diffusivity measure. If you were to actually implement kurtosis imaging, um, map out this D, this D is not the same MD that you will get from the DTI model. It is not. It is actually uh, what we call D sub DKI. This is what we call a kurtosis corrected diffusivity. So this is a very different quantity. It's in theory supposed to show you the same thing as the conventional MD, but in practice it probably doesn't. And I'll show you some examples of that. Again, we resorted to the UK Bell Bank, you know, during COVID times, um, using existing data was an easy way to carry on. Um, so we now use both shells. They had a 1000 uh, shell and a 2000 second millimeter square shell. So we used the DKI uh, MATLAB toolbox as was proposed by Varad and colleagues. And first of all, uh, just as reality check, do we see a general uniform um, kurtosis reduction with advancing age? And the answer is yes. So this confirms uh, findings from our previous work using DKI. So generally, tissue complexity goes down. This is considered as the sign of neurodegeneration. Um, even if we were to break this down into axial and radio, we still see it. So uh, reduced tissue complexity um, seems to spare this um, this posterior inferior region. Remember this this interesting region that we discovered earlier. When it comes to axial kurtosis, there doesn't seem to be a reduction. What does that mean? It means that the only kurtosis reduction here is in the radial direction. So so that is interesting. Um, I'll also come back to this. Now, um, what if this kurtosis corrected DTI? Uh, uh, parameter set. So I talked about this before. These are not the same as conventional DTI uh, parameters. So FA is kurtosis corrected. MD is also kurtosis corrected. Um, so by and large, we still see the same trends that we saw before in terms of diffusivity going up with age and FA going down with age. But what is this? An increased FA, increased FA with age. And what is this? This here is a decreased diffusivity with age. So as far as I can recall from our earlier studies, the best we could do is see nothing here. We saw no AD effect in aging, but with kurtosis correction, now suddenly we see something. It is blue. It is a reduction of diffusivity in the axial direction. So um, going back to our prediction, does uh, DKI corrected DTI, D 
DTI corrected DTI have higher sensitivity to aging than conventional DTI. So we took a ratio of the effect size from the kurtosis corrected DTI parameters, MD, FA, AD, and RD, um, in the numerator. And the, in the denominator is the conventional DTI parameters, the very same set. And we see overall, yes, diffusivity um, parameters corrected for kurtosis do offer uh, overwhelmingly higher age sensitivity. So, so this has not really been looked at before. Um, even when you look at kurtosis versus diffusivity images, it's, it's not clear whether the diffusivity has been cor um, corrected for kurtosis. This is something you can get directly from the DKI data without any extra work, and it does give you increased aging sensitivity in this case. And this is just an illustration of that as a scatter plot. So we see various trends in our, in our data. Uh, the majority of voxels demonstrated this increasing MD with age. Uh, so the red line is a DKI corrected version of MD, and the X axis is age, and the blue line represents the non kurtosis corrected MD. The same thing uh, with FA, so FA decreases uh, largely in line, whereas FA increases, we, we do see this is a true FA increase in aging. So, so this is what we can, we can show with this data. And again, this interesting region where we saw no AD effect in aging with our conventional DTI parameters, with DKI corrected AD, we do see a decrease. So this shows us something is not is happening. It's not nothing is happening. That region may not be spared after all. Now, if we look at um, so this is just to reinforce that the sensitivity of of kurtosis um, here, kurtosis versus the sensitivity of diffusivity. Now, this is not con uh, comparing kurtosis corrected diffusivity. This is kurtosis itself. It is also higher than the sensitivity of diffusivity um, in aging. So this is really looking at everything derived from the kurtosis model. And if you thought that the MD corrected for kurtosis was good, um, MK can be even more sensitive. So there are, there are various spots in which it is not, and so this is where so the, the decision has to come in what, what to choose in these cases of blue, where kurtosis has lower sensitivity than MD. So, so yeah, it's, it's for the most part more sensitive, but not always. Um, so now comes the time to actually compare vis-a-vis -vis diffusivity versus kurtosis. Um, and on the left are the diffusivity values corrected for kurtosis, and on the right are the kurtosis themselves. And I, I mentioned before these regions of interest where you have the selective, supposed selective degeneration in this internal capsule region, which is shown by increased, so orange FA pattern. And when it comes to kurtosis, there's nothing special about it. Actually, it, it's a decreased kurtosis along with every other voxel. So, so you can tell this definitely does not mean the tissue is getting healthier. It isn't. It's just the configuration of the tissue is changing. Um, now a closer look at these sort of specific comparisons with um, with regions of interest in mind. Uh, so we are interested in two regions in particular uh, that show this kind of unique behavior, internal capsule and the posterior inferior white matter. So in the internal capsule region, negative axokurtosis effect overlaps with increased FA. So this means that the tissue complexity along the axial direction is in decline. That could mean, so again, that's a sign of selective degeneration possible. Um, AD increases, but not RD. So this is another interesting thing because we, in this region where we see this kind of yellow right here, um, the selectively degenerating region, there's only diffusivity increase in one direction. In contrast, in most of the other regions, um, negative 
radio kurtosis effects prevail and they overlap with negative axial kurtosis effects. So, so here in all of the other regions, almost all of the other regions, everything is just going down. It's a much simpler story. But what about this gray region here? This is sort of the posterior inferior region. Um, so AD reduction overlaps with RD increase. So this shows this could potentially be a case of early degeneration. This may actually be the region that's last to degenerate. In our population up to age of 69, we already see this. So as you go higher in age, this might become more apparent. So more uh, cross-validation between GTI and GKI. Again, so this is looking at mean diffusivity, axial diffusivity, and radio diffusivity compared with their kurtosis counterparts. So how do they compare one to one? Um, this is a much simpler trend, I would say. So in the internal capsule region and the anterior superior tracts, which are shown as being green, Positive AD effects overlap with negative AK effects. So this is, you know, nothing um, unexpected. Uh, positive RD effects overlap with negative RK effects. Also, nothing unexpected. So these are all consistent with general degeneration and demyelination. And both pointing to degeneration happening only one direction. So these are overwhelmingly um, Degenerating re regions with no sort of con contradictory configuration changes. And lastly, what happens to AK and RK when FA decreases? So FA decreases. This is sort of where what we see as a sign of degeneration. So do we see AK and RK all both going down to support that general sense of degeneration? Yes, we do. AK and RK mostly coincide. Uh, indicating reduced complexity of the tissue and in over coinciding with reduced FA. So that's what we expected to see. With the exception of the posterior inferior white matter where AK effects are diminished. So, so this is blue. Blue means there's no overlap. So here it means that AK is not really doing much in this posterior inferior region in particular. Um, there are a few other regions um, that show blue, but I would say our focus is in this posterior inferior region also because of what the diffusivity measures showed us. So I know this is a lot of material to take in and you're welcome to read our paper that's now online. Um, but the overall story is that um, so crossing fibers will mess up the tensor uh, diffusion tensor interpretations. And this is where kurtosis correction can be helpful. Uh, especially um, when they're crossing tensor, crossing fibers, but also, also when there's early degeneration to the point where uh, conventional tensor doesn't know what to do with it. it. It is not apparent what the interpretation should be, as in the case of this posterior inferior white matter. So this is a, a region that we will watch for with more of our other diffusivity techniques. So here is just a scatter plot to reinforce our conclusions that in most regions, uh, positive acts of diffusivity, uh, age effects overlap with positive RD age effects. And this is sort of the prevailing wisdom. In the posterior inferior white matter, the AD effect becomes negative. So, so it seems that in the axial direction, now the diff diffusivity becomes impaired it's like blocked by something. But in the radio direction, diffusivity is enhanced as we expect from neurodegeneration. And in most regions, negative AK and RK coincide, uh, demonstrating overall reduced tissue complexity. So uh, with all of this, we came up with this cartoon to kind of demonstrate with, in the context of DKI and DTI, what sort of phenomena we can expect to decipher. So on the top is a row dedicated to single fibers and the bottom is a row dedicated to crossing fibers. So if we have this is a crossing a healthy fiber and in a simple case where we see 
Um, this is the, the traditional study where diffusivity goes up, kurtosis and FA go down. So this is the simplest case in which single shell DTI is more than enough. And it can show you all you need to see. In early stages of degeneration, we don't have sort of a complete elimination of a fiber yet. We have a fiber that's sort of dis disintegrating. At this point, we might see some increase in radio diffusivity, but some impeded axial diffusivity resulting in no MD change. So no MD change, this is the puzzling part, but doesn't mean nothing is happening. Whereas in the final stage where the degeneration has occurred, um, we do see that diffusivity goes up and, and uh, kurtosis goes down. So this sort of would be consistent with this other fiber population model. Now coming to the crossing fiber bundles, when we have crossings, things become complicated. So in the sim simple case where both the crossing fibers degenerate equally, then it would just be like it was a single fiber case. So diffusivity will go up, kurtosis will go down, everything will degenerate together. However, if we have this sort of selective degeneration of just one fiber population, that is not what we're going to see. We're going to see an FA going up. We may see AD going up. We may see these things contradictory to what we expect from aging. And finally, in very early stages of um, sort of degeneration, or this is actually advanced selective degeneration, you can see the secondary fiber is completely gone. Then it becomes more like the, the case of a single fiber population. So, so it's, it's difficult to tell from just one tensor model which it is, which is why I put in these combinations of different parameters to help us clarify the interpretation. For example, the internal capsule region is characterized by positive FA age effect, also positive MO age effect, negative kurtosis and radio diffusivity effects and positive AD effects. So it's almost like we go to a lookup table and we say, which one is this? And it matches this case here. The other case, posterior inferior white matter is characterized by a lack of MD age effect. Negative are radio kurtosis and AD age effects, positive radio diffusivity age effects and negative FA age effects with um, very minimal AK age effects. So this is, um, we're not sure exactly what this means, but we do have a theory that this is in general consistent with demyelination and slowed axonal diffusivity, maybe hindrance of diffusion by intracellular debris. And this, if we consult our fiber um, cartoon, is most consistent with this case in which there is zero MD effect. So how to get more from conventional DTI? This is probably my last slide. Um, the normal anisotropy rather than FA is highly recommended to enhance your sensitivity, uh, especially when you're interested in studying crossing fiber regions. And the mode of anisotropy can also provide additional information to show the degree of diffusion um, change. So it should be used, it's in the tensor and usually it's not used. An uh, added value of measuring DKI parameters uh, can definitely enhance our sensitivity to the crossing fiber diffusion changes um, it is sensitive. Kurtosis, after all, is sensitive to changes in cellular environment. It can be misinterpreted. So it is helpful to have this in conjunction with our diffusivity measures to kind of just cross check. Are we still, you know, self consistent? So AD reductions without AK reduction could indicate intra-axonal debris accumulation, which um, can precede demyelination as the literature already documents. Conversely, in the scenario of um, incidental abnormality findings, AD reduction with um, AD reduction with AK reduction could also reflect axonal breakdown uh, coupled with edema. This is in the case of um, uh, things like inflammation or stroke. 
So, so these are things we don't expect, but nonetheless, it helps to have two sets of parameters to help uh, narrow down the interpretation. So um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I'd like to thank my, my lab, my, my excellent members who sort of bravely moved forward during COVID, which has been difficult for everyone, and uh, my funding sources. And most of all, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. I was going to field some questions from the in-person audience here, and then after okay. that, see if the online audience has questions. I'm standing up here, so I guess I can go first. Um, sure. This is really, really interesting. I've actually spent quite a bit of time thinking through these things too, and it's clear that there is some error that this is accounting for because because these new corrected things are, are are less noisy and they're definitely improved what i've always wondered though is maybe if there's a a different interpretation than the ones that you guys have been um leaning on and so the location where these like crossing kissing fibers are um for sure that's where those are right but they also have other specific things about those fibers um that are different from other parts of the brain too. And so those are um, places where the, the fiber caliber is smaller consistently in those locations, like the internal capsule and all that subcortical stuff. Um, they're less myelinated and they're smaller caliber. And so I think that if that were the explanation, that might also give you the same thing. And then I, I started thinking about it more when you get to the, um, like particularly when you look through the splenium, the splenium is always kind of either like white and missed out or and we know that there's less age effects in the splenium um, but it also has quite a bit of different architecture too um, those are like big huge fat um, axons they have a lot of myelin and so then i was thinking that it's the same with the posterior inferior part that gets leaved out right and so mm -hmm. all these visual tracks they have to be um, broader caliber and they have to have more myelin because you know visual transmission has to go so fast so i was wondering if axon caliber and fiber packing density might also explain some of these things instead of or in addition to just the crossing fibers because those biological differences go with all those places um, where you highlighted these differences is that does that make sense oh um Yes, I know. I guess I was wondering. So, so fiber caliber, um, in 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 which way would you mind elaborating? Oh, so Where, not, what are you thinking? Yeah, not in um, DTI. So just like in primate studies, right? Where you know exactly it's been mapped across the vein, right? Where you know exactly like where like the tiny um, caliber axons live and where like the um, like broad uh, axon mm -hmm. caliber. Mm -hmm. um, are and so you you can see maps of that gradient across the brain too with aging and aging kind of attacks those smaller caliber fibers first it attacks like the less myelinated fibers first um so that pattern that that you show also exists and maps on to this gradient of like mm -hmm. you know like the genu has tiny I tiny see, caliber in the spelium yeah. these fat like caliber axons Interesting. Thank you for bringing that up. I was curious about this too. Why some fibers get attacked first? Sort of in if we're going with the selective degeneration story, then then why <laughs> the selection? What drives it? Um, so coming back to your story of the or sorry, your question of the interpretation, as we're looking at a relative effect, so we're comparing the same tensor to itself as a function of age. So I suppose whatever changes is a change on whatever caliber is it is starting out with. So if we're, we do see an increased FA in the voxels with small caliber fibers, then that is still an indication of, of something, the configuration of the fiber, the architecture of that voxel is changing, um, whether it be big or small um, fibers. Right? Am I understanding your question correctly? So it is yeah. sort of compared to itself. Um, and also to bolster that, perhaps we have some work that's kind of 
in progress that's not out yet. Uh, we use pixel based analysis with very high B values to look at the actual, you know, fibers that participate in each voxel. And we do have data showing that in these voxels showing increased FA in aging, there is one fiber population that's kind of bowing out sooner than the others. So in this particular case with the internal capsule, there are actually three fiber populations crossing um, each other. And so one of them is professionally more affected in aging. And so so I want to look more into this after this after this talk I mean, about this sort of degeneration, um, s I guess, timing versus the caliber. So so that is something we're, we're very fascinated by. Cool. Um, questions from the room? Yeah, Nick. What's the optimal number of shells doing ketosis? I don't know. <laughs> I think in general, um, if, if scan time was not a limitation, the more the better. So if you have a limited time, if you say, I got 10 minutes, so what can I do? What's the best thing to do with these 10 minutes? Then we have to adjust accordingly. It is always a trade off um, between the amount of information and sort of the, the signal to noise um, within a fixed amount of time. But the minimum you can use is two, and that's established. Do you gain anything beyond three, do you think, for for the timing and what it's worth? Like where do you think the diminishing um, return is? In theory, it shouldn't. In theory, two should be enough, but in practice, so motion is always an issue. Um, other noise factors are always an issue, so it's sort of fighting between the signal and the noise. Uh, so if there's anything to be gained by scanning longer or including more values, it would be um, to kind of combat the noise. But having said that, higher B values also are very noisy. So at some point, they are so noisy that they kind of mislead your fits. So, so maybe that's what you're getting at. Other questions from the room? Okay. Do we have questions from the online audience? Yes, we have one question. Um, they say, hi, Dr. Chen. Thank you for this excellent and very useful talk. I wondered if there is any chance that in aging studies, large DTI and DKI combination data sets can be used to develop models that can supplement DTI only data sets during data sets with kurtosis estimates. Um, uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, so, so there are already um, quite a number of more elaborate models developed. So, so I'm not yet at the stage where I'm ready to propose another one. I, I would say um, with more shells, we can definitely have a better idea of what the, 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 the underlying tissue is doing. And I, I think this is all we can tell. And then we have to, based on what we have found then we'll have to ask what would the next question be so based on that question we can sort of devise what other acquisition we would need um because if we have everything we need just based on this then we are we're very happy to just move forward with this but if there's something that's unanswerable um not necessarily apparent from this talk from today but definitely um there, there are questions about you know crossing versus casing fibers. Um, and so there's a whole literature on more elaborate DTI um, sort of diffusion models, I would say, that, that should be looked at first. Yeah, we don't need any new new development models quite yet. <laughs> we can figure out how to <laughs> We're the same. Yeah, we've, we've got quite a few already. Yeah. I okay. have one more question that just came in. Uh, thank you, excellent presentation. Have you correlated these DTI changes, uh, newer degeneration in pathology specimens of aging? Um, histology, you mean? Pathology specimens. Um, so, so I guess there are two ways to interpret this. One is so we have we don't have the histology, which is why we're doing pixel analysis, and the second is that we have not applied this to advanced. Um, age-related pathology like in Alzheimer's disease, so we have we have not yet. And another question that just came in right now. 
Uh, thank you for that excellent present explanation of crossing fiber effects on DTI, DKI metrics, and brain aging. I have two questions. What was the cognitive status of these subjects? And did you consider using NODDI, which is shown to overcome, overcome the partial volume effect by the compartment model? Sure, thank you for the questions. Um, so first, we, um, we have not, and second, um, or sorry, we, we have not looked at cognitive uh, differences, but all of the subjects are cognitively normal, as is the requirement for the study uh, recruitment. So um, they, they are so on top of all the sort of exclusion, exclusion criteria that UKB or the UK Bio Bank imposes, we further um, specify that we don't want anyone with a history of neurological disorders, uh, trauma, um, and not anyone who's on current medication. So, so these are our criteria. So as far as we can tell, these are normal, cognitively normal subjects. Um, and the second question is about NADI. So yes, NADI can also be used and it does require multi-shell acquisitions. Uh, so NADI is sort of seen as um, sort of the, the alternative to free water imaging in the, in, in the sense of the extracellular uh, term but also has this dispersion term and the intracellular fraction. So th these are all the things that we can also get from free water diffusion and kurtosis imaging in a way. Um, but, um, but we have not compared these two sets of techniques uh, one to one. However, we have compared free water based uh, extracellular compartment to naughty based extracellular compartment and they're strongly correlated. Okay, no more questions online. Okay, thank you so much for that talk. Um, we'll have to get you here in person sometime in the future. Um, yeah, I would love that. So yeah, sorry about here. this, and oh, I'm no, glad no, no, it could work out. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another round of applause for Dr. Chen. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.